welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 78, Entertaining Madrid, the Corral del Principe. Last time, the story of the life of Pedro Calderón de la Barca took us towards the end of the theatre of the Renaissance in Spain. But before we leave the Iberian Peninsula, I wanted to take a longer look at the Spanish playhouse that was so central to the success of Spanish theatre in the period. Fortunately, we can do this in some detail, thanks to some pretty extensive documentation that tells us a lot about one of the theatres in Madrid, and particularly about the theatre building itself. Knowing how a theatre looked and worked, both from the point of view of the actors and the audience, can tell us a lot about the way performances were planned and performed, and what aspects of a national theatre were unique to a particular country and period. The details we have about the Corral del Principe are far from complete, but what we have is invaluable, as they provide more extensive evidence than we have for any other European Renaissance period theatre. I've already mentioned the development of theatre buildings in episode 74, the Spanish Playhouse, its manager, his actors and their audience. So just to remind you, playhouses started to be constructed in Spain from about 1550 onward, as theatre took a more commercial turn and moved away from the religious celebrations and the auto sacramental and the court presentations of Italian plays and Spanish plays written in the mould of the Italians. These original Spanish theatres were open air and probably only used a crude raised wooden platform stage in front of an open space with some benches and standing space. They became known as corrals because they often used the courtyard location, something already common in the Spanish architecture of the time, and provided an open and accessible space where a controllable entrance could be established. Then, by the 1570s, purpose-built playhouses were being constructed in various Spanish cities, making use of open courtyards and other spaces between buildings. Madrid took centre stage in 1561, when the court moved to that city located in the central high plain of the country. The commercial theatre in Madrid was placed in the control of a charitable brotherhood, the Brotherhood of the Sacred Passion, created in 1565 which was responsible for producing commercial theatre and distributing the profits to local hospitals and other charities. Records from as early as 1568 show the Brotherhood produced plays in yards that they owned, but they soon moved to hiring larger spaces in the city. They began constructing a purpose-built corral in October 1579 on the Cala de la Cruz, which was fitted out by transferring benches and platforms from the spaces that they were currently renting. This was a concerted effort to focus their attention on a single home for public theatre in Madrid that could accommodate significant numbers in the audience. Following the opening of the Corral de la Cruz, there were some disputes within the Brotherhood and a division into two sponsoring groups was agreed, but still with charitable benefits in mind. The Corral de la Cruz gets justified honourable mention in this episode, and I don't want to give the impression that the Principe was necessarily a better or more successful theatre than the Cruz. It's just that we have more information about the Principe, so it gets the attention. But where we do have information from the crews, it's used as useful evidence to corroborate and clarify what we have about the Principe, as the two theatres were similar in size and shape. You will see that, as with much from this period, the study of the details of the Corral is, through necessity, topped with many assumptions and a lot of speculation. In February 1582, the Brotherhood purchased two houses and yards on the Cala del Principe for 800 ducats. The plot is described as facing onto the main street, with adjoining houses to the right and left and another at the rear. Cala del Principe was a city centre street, but perhaps not as we think of city centres today. It was relatively narrow, with a mixture of buildings crowded along its length. Most were built hard up against each other, and where there were streets running off the Principe, they were short and narrow, alleyways really. Just opposite was the convent of Santa Anna. Again, perhaps not something we would expect in city centres now. The Brotherhood had the support of the King for their project, and a building very similar to the Corral de la Cruz was planned and construction began. From the start, there was a sense of rivalry between the two theatres, even though the Principe was advertised as being created as a home for the Zaruzela rather than the Commedia. As things turned out, the Principe was soon presenting both types of entertainment and in direct competition with the crews. Before too long, the Principe stole playwrights and performers from the crews, including Lope de Vega himself. 
but the growing city could support two theatres, and both survived for a long period. There are few records of the original construction, but it is recorded that by September 1583, the construction of the Corral del Principe was still not finished. Despite this, the first performance there took place on the 21st of that month. This is some 18 months after the foundations were laid, and it is explicitly recorded that the stands and the galleries and the windows had yet to be started. That suggests that there were some significant delays during structural works, and underfunding of the project seems to be the most likely explanation. Construction seems to have speeded up once performances started, which we can probably put down to a renewed sense of urgency and the improved cash flow from the takings generated by each performance. What the records tell us is that by 1602 the third floor was complete and the theatre could be operated as fully functioning. Further construction continued sporadically over the next three decades until the roof and the internal rooms were completed. The entire project wasn't finished until 1636. After this, any construction was confined to repair work and what are generally considered to be minor changes. Although we don't have plans for the early theatre, there are street plans from the same period that can be compared to more detailed plans from 1735. The buildings around the corral are very little changed in that period, so we can make some reliable assumptions about the total area available to the theatre. The sighting of entrances, exits and balconies changed over time, but the basic area and playing space remained more or less unchanged over 150 years. Because the site was hemmed in on three sides by buildings owned by other parties, some of whom soon came to realise the financial benefits of living adjacent to the corral, when it came to expanding the corral, the only option was to go up, and even then there were limitations. So, from these plans from 1735, documents from 1744 when a land title search was carried out detailing the buildings around the corral, and others on the Cala del Principe, and from other more fragmentary evidence, it's possible to build a picture of the Corral del Principe with some confidence. The entrance to the Corral building was through four doors in the façade wall that faced the main street. Later in the life of the Corral, and at various times, this number was increased to seven. Of the original four doors, one led via some stairs to the boxes on the third floor of the Corral. The second was for access to a storeroom, the third was the main entrance, taking the audience onto the main lobby and then onto the yard, known as the patio in Spain, in front of the stage. As the main entrance, this was the only double door. The fourth door took some of the ladies to their reserved balconies. The increase in the number of doors was for practical reasons and to accommodate minor changes in the features of the services provided during an afternoon's entertainment. For example, for a while the store was divided up to accommodate a tavern in the complex, which required its own door. But later on, this was again sealed up as the position of the tavern was changed. Other doors opened in the front façade and then sometimes closed up again were attempts to change the access to the galleries and boxes. At one time, a secure route to the counting house seems to have been deemed necessary, which required further changes. One of the issues with a theatre being built between other buildings was that making changes to the internal structures was quite difficult, and it's an issue that plagued the corral throughout its life. A small adjacent building, hardly wide enough to be used as a house, was acquired and used to add access points. But unless you were coming through the main entrance, you had to make your way to your seat through a warren of passageways that circumnavigated the building. The breaking of the façade wall to create and amend the entrances caused weaknesses in the structure, and in 1645 the frontage had to be significantly repaired. There was a proposal suggesting that several of the doors, which are described as being very narrow, be sealed up to improve the support for the wall. In the end, four additional pillars were built into the wall to provide that support, so we have to assume that these different doors and passages to funnel audiences into different parts of the building were considered necessary. Before we leave the façade that faced the Calle del Principe, I need to give you an idea of what it looked like. Although the building was basically a wooden construction, the façade was made of painted brick. At times, this was probably whitewashed, but it might have been red. The best guess at the total size of the frontage is that it was 22 metres wide and 13 metres high. That's 72 feet by 42 feet, for those of you still happier with imperial measurements. <laughs> 
a lower roof covered the entrances and the area leading to the patio. The upper roof covered the seating area and part of the patio, leaving the central area over the patio open to the elements and of course plenty of light. The lower roof, about 5 metres or 16 feet off the ground at its lowest point, was tiled and pitched so that it reached just over 7 metres, that's 23 feet, from the ground when it joined the vertical sides of the upper storey of the theatre. The lower roof had five attic windows incorporated into it. The upper roof was also tiled and sat on the supporting wall and pillars that rose from its starting point at about 7 metres to a high point of 13 metres, 42 feet. Like all chorales, from the earliest days women were kept separate from the male audience, in accordance with the ideas of feminine modesty prevalent at the time. This was accommodated by the dedicated entrance at the front and by a women-only entrance to the chorale on Cala del Prado, a street that ran at a 45 degree angle to the Cala del Principe. Internal stairs then allowed the ladies to enter their reserved balconies without having to encounter men. The male audience had the use of the yard, the side stands and any benches in the side or central areas. The women's balconies, known as casuelas, were in the upper levels directly opposite the stage. The casuelas were probably grilled, again for the purposes of the modesty of the ladies. Casuelas means cooking pot, perhaps referring to the heat generated in the enclosed spaces in the Spanish summer, or perhaps to something of how the men imagined so many ladies all crowded together might feel. The separation was great, in theory, for those who were concerned about it. But there are records that talk of disturbances at the street entrance to the ladies' stairs, where men would gather and call out messages and, perhaps inspired by the sight of an exposed ankle as the ladies made their way upstairs, blushing behind their fans, some cruder suggestions. From the street, the façade with its narrow and low doorways gave the impression of a very enclosed building. Once through the main door, you were in the entrance building. This was covered by the lower roof and wasn't a big area, so there must have been an immediate rise in temperature as you moved through a passage into the patio, or off to the side to find the corridor to your seat. When exiting the passage into the patio, you probably got the impression of light and fresher air. The internal walls were whitewashed, the brightness of the walls offset against the dark wooden pillars supporting the roof. Above, you could see three floors reaching up to the partial roof, and most likely, blue sky and sunshine from the open part of the roof coming onto the patio. On the ground floor, on both sides of the entrance tunnel that led to the patio, there were two rooms with railings and platforms called accommodores. The name is of uncertain origin, but perhaps it relates to the fact that a housekeeping store was originally located on them, or perhaps because the street vendors put their stalls on and in front of these platforms to accommodate the arriving audience. In the heat of the Spanish sun, the provision of refreshments was probably a very significant feature of your arrival at the corral. There's a suggestion of a cloakroom in this area too, although one has to wonder what it would have been used for in an open-air theatre in a country with a predictable climate. Although, having said that, the one time I have been in Madrid, just driving through on the way south, I was caught in a vicious summer thunderstorm that we could see rolling across the plain towards us for miles. If one of those hit during a performance, or as you made your way to the corral, you would want some protection. Once through the passageway, you could look up and see the wooden beam supporting the roof high above. This structure really was impressive. On either side of the patio and behind you, over the entrance tunnel, there are wooden benches on the first level. If you face the stage and look to your left, the north side of the building, the patio is contained by a small wall, just less than one metre or three feet high. On top of this sits a wooden railing of about the same height again. Equally spaced along this side of the patio and rising up from the wall are four wooden pillars that are supporting the roof. A corridor, about two metres wide, runs behind the railing as far as the front of the stage. This served as access to the stands. The basic entry charge taken at the main door let you into the patio. There was an additional charge for access to any of the seated areas, including the seats on the side stands behind this railing, so the entrance there would have been used as a collection point. The seating is divided into two sections. The larger part ran from the back of the patio to the stage and had five rows of seats progressively raised towards the rear as you would expect. 
The shorter section ran from the front of the stage to its rear, it had three rows of seats and no passage in front of the first row nearest the stage, just space for maybe one or two rows of floor level benches to be placed there. The benches were divided so that each could accommodate two or three people, with the occasional addition of a single seat bench, presumably because there was room to squeeze only a single bench in the end of any given row. The configuration of the side benches varied over time, but the 35 to 40 benches accommodated about 100 and maybe up to 120 people at a time. I'll give some further details of the estimated capacity of the corral towards the end of this episode. Behind and above the stands, on the party walls of the neighbouring houses, there were four rooms. Three had windows with bars, and the fourth, nearest the corner of the corral, had a full balcony. These rooms were rented out by their owners, some per day, the others for the entire season, when wealthy patrons could pay an annual sum for the privilege of the view. Above these windows, there were a further five balcony rooms that also looked out over the interior of the corral from the neighbouring building. Each balcony was about a metre long and typically benches were provided for paying guests. Above these balconies was the highest part of the building, which contained attic rooms immediately under the roof. They were very small rooms, with a low ceiling and divided from each other only by thin walls. Access to each room was through a door at the back that was reached through a narrow corridor. Seating was available in these rooms, but conditions were certainly cramped and presumably very hot and stuffy. The south side of the kraal had some very similar features. Behind the benches, the adjoining buildings made use of their windows and balconies. In this case, there were five windowed rooms, four balconies above those, and five balcony rooms above those. On this side, there were nine attic rooms. Looking towards the stage above the main entrance to the corral was more bench seating, and as mentioned, the women-only grilled balcony. To either side of these balconies and protruding back into the upper level of the entrance room were the VIP rooms. The most central room was reserved for the Mayor of Madrid, his guests and the city councillors. The other rooms were occupied by various nobles and dignitaries, including the President of the Council of Castile. Access to these rooms was via a narrow passageway, which afforded some privacy for the special guests and control to ensure only the entitled were allowed through. On the top floor, there was more bench seating until this area was turned into a meeting and greeting entertainment space in 1715. And so to the business end of the corral. The playing area of the stage was 8 metres wide by 4.5 metres deep, that's 26 feet by nearly 15 feet, and stood about 1.5 metres or 5 feet above the yard. On both sides there were removable wooden railings, beyond which were the benches, some seating area and the side seats that I've already mentioned. The stage was covered by a large internal hanging roof and bordered by large wooden pillars on each corner that were part of the roof support. Behind the stage was the tiring or locker room. This was an area that spanned all five levels of the corral, three of which were visible to the audience at the rear of the stage. It provided pillars and two levels of balcony for performers to use as part of the plays, and then storage and dressing room space above and behind. From the lower three-level portion, an actor could make an entrance or an exit to the stage through either of two doors, or via the stairs to either of the balconies at the rear of the stage, meaning an actor could move freely through all of the backstage area to the point of the next entrance in the play without being seen. Underneath the stage, there was a basement that was accessible by the staircase that linked all of the levels of the building to the stage area. This was used partly for storage of props and wardrobe and, at later dates, accommodated some stage machinery. At certain times, the sun, usually so beneficial to the open-air theatre, could cause a problem for the viewers. So a retractable awning was added to the roof. When required, this could be pulled over the opening in the roof via a series of ropes and pulleys, providing the squinting audience with some relief although, presumably, that also sent the temperature in the corral up a notch or two as well. With the central patio being a standing area and accommodating a large portion of the audience, estimates of the capacity of the corral are quite difficult to make. How tightly were people packed in? What was the concept of personal space back then? How was the capacity controlled, if indeed it was at all? 
These are questions of logistics, but also speak to cultural norms and expectations that are harder to speculate on. There are box office records from various times that, as you might imagine, would be easy enough to extrapolate into audience numbers. But if you've listened to the members episodes that include details from Henslow's diary, you'll already know about the types of issues that we have with such records. There is a very similar problem with the financial records from the performances by the Admiral's men in London. However, a chance recording from 1586 gives us some ideas. This record suggests that there was a special performance for women only, which is interesting in itself. Can we assume this was not a one-off occurrence, and that there was a demand from women for theatrical entertainment that was so strong it warranted such special performances? That seems reasonable to me, but this is, I believe, the only record that we have. It tells us that the entrance fee was one real, and that 760 reals were taken at the box office. So, the theatre had a capacity for 760 persons. Well, maybe. We don't know that it was a sold-out performance, or that the entire theatre was open to the female audience. Perhaps benches were placed in the yard in deference to the weaker sex, or maybe the yard was left empty and the women used their usual seats and the side benches only. We, We just don't know, and therefore we can't take this number at face value. In 1668, an Italian visitor, one Signor Maglotti, commented that the Principe could comfortably accommodate 2,000 people. So these two numbers are clearly at odds. Calculating the numbers that could sit on the benches to one side of the yard is perhaps easier, although estimates are surprisingly varied here too. We don't know if all of the side stand areas were indeed used as seated viewing. It's quite possible that the back rows were used as standing spaces, which increases the capacity of that area. So the best guess is that the capacity of what we think of as the lateral seating area in the corral was somewhere between 400 and 500 men. In support of this, there are records that say that the theatre that replaced the Principe, which had very closely the same dimensions and layout, could accommodate 459 men in the lateral seating area. There are incidental mentions that give a little more detail. The benches reserved for members of the clergy were said to accommodate 90 clerics, suggesting that the priests and deacons were squashed into their area rather more tightly than your average citizen. Perhaps we could assume that the women in their grilled balcony area were similarly closely packed. We know the dimensions of the patio area, so a good estimate for the capacity there, allowing one and a half square feet per person, is 460 men. The capacity available in the balconies and the upper rooms has also been calculated using similar assumptions and with a lot of caveats. But the consensus is that in its original state, at the first performances before the upper floors were completed, the chorale had a capacity for about 1,000 people, with roughly half of the audience being accommodated in the standing space on the patio. One thing we can be sure of is that a popular show would see a packed house, with people crushed in more tightly than we would consider safe today. The theatre employed pushers, who would make sure that the audience were as tightly packed as possible. Maybe the mosh pit of a popular concert is the closest that we can get to today. As ever, the more you paid, the better your seat or standing space, and the more room you had but even the VIPs were likely crammed into their private rooms and balconies for a good show, and any thought of comfort is entirely relative. After completion of the upper floors, the corral capacity was more or less doubled, with the yard capacity unchanged. So it's likely that the Italian tourist who enjoyed an afternoon at the Spanish corral made a good estimate of the crowd with his 2,000 people, or he'd asked the right person. The rivalry between the theatres in Madrid continued throughout their lives. That rivalry was artistic, with each competing for the best performers, writers and backstage staff, and there was a great deal of poaching of talent between the two. But it also spilled into supporters of the theatres, so that each had a willing gang of, for the most part, young men, who were happy to disrupt performances at their rival, and occasionally things turned violent, as the respective theatres tried to defend their audience. As we've heard, this culture ran deep in the young men of Madrid, and it was present in the city for generations, only finally dying out in the early 19th century. <laughs>
The Corral del Principe survived for 162 years before it was pulled down. But this was not because of structural issues or advances in theatre technology requiring a redefined space. Its demise came about because of the rather more prosaic issues of the ownership of the windows and balconies in the adjoining houses. The Corral management had a right to part of the income from these viewing spaces, but collection of the income seems to have been a bit of a problem almost from the first performance at the theatre. The theatre managers would request payment, but often met with flat refusals, delaying tactics and partial payments. In an effort to improve collections in the early 1700s, the theatre tried to establish the right of ownership of each window and balcony and managed to persuade the city council to legalise that request. But the response appears to have been very half-hearted, and we can only suspect that there was rather too much vested interest in the houses next to the theatre and the value that the theatre attached to them for anyone in power to want to rock the boat too much. Arguments went back and forth for decades, and there were several more legal attempts to establish ownerships and extract income, until, presumably with much frustration, theatre managers began looking for a new site to relocate to. In 1737, a search was commissioned, a location was found and the building work costed out. But for unknown reasons, it was decided to rebuild on the current site. So the old building was torn down and the new walls of the replacement constructed to simply block out visible access from the adjacent buildings. There must have been some other reasons to replace the original building, which was no doubt showing its age. But this also implies that the missing revenue from the boxes and balconies must have been considerable to prompt such drastic action. In the new theatre on the site, all of the revenue from the theatre was in the hands of the managers. Today, the site of the Principe is still a theatre, the grand and elegant Teatro Español, a building constructed on the Principe site in the early 19th century. The site of the convent of Santa Ana is now an open plaza full of restaurants and cafes required by the modern theatre audience. It's a site of much of the city nightlife too. The nuns who formerly resided there are probably looking down from above with a degree of shock and despair. Across town, the Corral de la Cruz did not fare so well. In 1743, the original building was remodelled in Baroque style by architect Pedro de Ribeira. That building was nearing its 100th birthday when the style of that particular architect fell dramatically out of favour. In 1849, a royal order singled out the theatre as a shame for art, and a demolition order was approved. Somehow, the theatre managed to dodge that bullet for a few years and even reopened as a theatre briefly between 1850 and 1852. It was finally closed and stood empty for a further five years before the demolition was carried out in 1859. The only sign of the existence of this once great theatre is a small plaque on the façade of a restaurant that now occupies part of the site. A sad end, perhaps, but I understand the restaurant serves an excellent patatas bravas, so worth a visit, surely. Next time, it's time to return to Italy. The impact of Italian theatre didn't just stop once the French and the Spanish caught on to the explosive impact of the Italian Renaissance. Far from it, in fact. And we need to follow the significant developments in Italian acting styles that were to have a lasting influence well beyond the period. But first, we need to look at some more technical developments and get the Italian theatre in perspective. In the meantime, if you'd like to support the podcast, there are links in the show notes to coffee.com for a one-off tip and to the Patreon members area for more sustained support. The latest members episode is the family history and early memories of Konstantin Stanislavski from his autobiography, My Life in Art, as he thinks on how old Russia transformed during his childhood and theatre developed in Russia. You can get access to that and all the other episodes on Patreon for a small monthly fee which goes towards offsetting my hosting and research costs. It's just me doing this here so I really do appreciate your continued support for the podcast in whatever form. If you have some time, please do consider leaving a review so that other people can find the podcast. I'm told that reviews really do help improve visibility for a podcast in what is a very crowded space. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.